right, so for those who don't know, I did beat Dawn Trail a few days ago. It was a very long stream. This is all going to build to my thoughts about Dawn Trail, but I thought it was important to express my opinions about the other things. And plus, I never really did a proper comparison of these uh, expansions. I've said my thoughts here and there, but it's nice to just kind of reflect after everything we've been through. I don't really follow the Final Fantasy XIV community. I really enjoy the game, but I'm not that much in the trenches. I don't love it that much. I just really enjoy it. I only do the MSQ. That That's where I'm coming from. Okay, and I think that's important to, to know. Lastly, you might be wondering if I wanted to do the post MSQ stuff in like its own tier list, or why am I not doing it in this tier list? It's, quite frankly, it's because I, I don't remember <laughs> where a lot of things happens. Like, sometimes I'm like, did that happen in the actual expansion or the post quest? So I'm just gonna talk about it, just, just assume the post MSQ, I'm talking about it alongside the main expansion. It's just been a long time since I've done some of this stuff. So there's gonna be a lot of names that I don't remember. Hopefully you guys in chat help me a little bit. No, I'm not going to replay any of this. Most certainly, I'm not going to play A Realm Reborn. Here's the thing. I don't think any of these expansions are bad. That's why there's no D tier. I'm only doing S to C. Okay? It's because I enjoyed every one of these things. Right? I would not have played this game for over 200 hours. However, if there is one at the very bottom, I've always been confident. I've always known in my heart that it was A Realm Reborn. I know, look, I didn't, I wasn't there for 1.0, maybe that would be in D tier, I wasn't there. And I know A Realm Reborn, we all gotta thank it for, for reigniting the fire, right? If it wasn't for A Realm Reborn, we wouldn't be having all these cool things we can talk about and we can play with Final Fantasy XIV. So I'm not trying to put some disrespect on it. But especially in hindsight, I thought it was boring as hell. <laughs> A Realm Reborn I never want to replay. And really, the best things about A Realm Reborn are the memes. Like, the... Um, what are you rating these on? Story? Gameplay? It's mostly gonna be about the story. I will mention, like, certain boss fights and stuff I liked, but... We'll mention, like, other, like, factors later on. But just solely in, <laughs> just solely in regards to A Realm Reborn, it's, it's very heavy on the world building. And that's fine, right? Because when you have this very intricate, complicated narrative, you gotta have a foundation. And that was the job of A Realm Reborn. Like, when you have all these moving parts, yeah, of course, it's just gonna take a while. It's it's gonna take a while to set the table, right? And, and I'm not blaming A Realm Reborn for being that. I think that's totally understandable. But it is kind of a slog to get through, and I know this because they had to cut down on several quests. <laughs> Like I said, some good memes. That Those are really the, the times that I reflect upon the most. Besides, obviously, just playing it for the first time. It's always going to be special for me in, in that regard, where I'm just... I haven't played an MMO in a long time, so that was really cool. Getting to know everything for the first time, learning with you guys. Of course, that's always going to be cherished. But aside from that, I love the memes. The Prey Return to the Waking Sands, of course, great meme, because you really do be doing that. Uh, the one fight that they patched, I believe, where it was like this 8-on-1 fight, it was near the, the lighthouse or whatever, and it was so easy. <laughs> it was like laughably easy. In terms of the conflict, it's kind of standard, you know, the Empire is acting up. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's why A Realm Reborn just kind of has to be at the bottom, right? I had a lot of good times with it, but it was mostly because it was the first time, you know? You're always gonna savor that first time, assuming it was good. The most memorable part of A Realm Reborn was in the post-patch quest. I felt like this was when the game, like, really started to pick up, the story at least. It was the, the cutscene where, you know, they had that political meeting, and then Nanamo gets poisoned, and it gets all crazy and shit. That part is still one of the most memorable moments for me. The thing is, though, that doesn't really carry it out of C tier, because I feel like, in hindsight, it didn't matter all that much. Like, I'm not saying it didn't matter, but 
compared to how you feel in the moment, it, 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 it didn't like have that lasting impact, at least that I wanted. Like, for example, since we're talking about spoilers, for example, Nanamo doesn't even die, right? It was like a fake poison. So, like, things like that, I, 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 I wish you could feel a lot more of the impact because it, it really was such a special moment. It was crazy. Um, what's up, Roshi? I know. It's crazy. Nanamo should have died. <laughs> that's the that's the hill I'm dying on. Uh, also, another meme I forgot to mention was one of my favorite moments of the entire story was how they end the Realm Reborn. They're like, I declare thee a Realm Reborn. Everyone's happy for like two seconds. <laughs> First post-patch quest, <laughs> shit goes down immediately. Right after she says that, freaking earthquake, volcano starts erupting, whatever else happens. Like that that's what I mean about the memes. That it's just it's it's a good time, fond memories. But as I stated, I feel like it's the least compelling by a pretty big landslide. At least for me. I also believe it, it might have not been... I think it was. I think it was in the post-quest. I've mentioned it before. It's like a chain of quests about cheese, I think. <laughs> you have to do this quest this quest line about cheese. I think it was during the post-A Realm Reborn quest. I might be wrong about that. But that was stupid. So, I and I, and I think that kind of epitomizes the the slog that I felt about a realm reborn one more sorry one more shout out before I go to heaven's word shout out to Sid shout out to Sid Sid is still one of my favorite characters <laughs> that moment when we were in that dungeon and we messed up like we left Sid behind by accident <laughs> and then he was just trying his best to get through that that was a very fond memory of mine, still to this day. One of my favorite dungeon moments. I've always regarded Heaven's Word as one of my favorite expansions, and I, I, it's hard for me to explain why. I think a big part of it is just kind of sentimental value, like if I'm going to be completely transparent. That's like when I started to like truly feel this game is sick. Like that's when I truly started to like really enjoy my time. Even outside of the MMO part of it, the playing with friends part of it, Heaven's Word is when I first started to like just appreciate it, like as an individual. I was kind of doing some refreshers before this tier list, and I realized that it, it's not like it's their first appearance, but it's like the first time that they have a prominent role. You get the first prominent role of Alize. Of Kryl, and most importantly, Edgy Thancred. Uh, those three things alone, <laughs> Alize and Kryl in particular, are two of my favorite characters. I really felt the stakes of it. You know, obviously you can't compare it to like later on, especially Endwalker. Endwalker, you you expect there to be a lot of stakes because it's the finale of the whole thing, right? But Heaven's Word, there was a lot of stakes. You had um, Isale. Isale freaking dies, right? Right before Heaven's Word, you had Moonbrita. Moonbrita just dies. And I'm not sure exactly when it happened because, you know, it wasn't that important to me personally. But around this time, I think Papalimo dies. <laughs> so, there's a lot of deaths. A lot was lost. Harshafont, how could I forget? Harshafont dies. It's crazy. People dying left and right. Whether it's within Heaven's Word or directly around. And and I love, you know, don't take this the wrong way. But I love a good old character death. <laughs> I love it when, when you feel the stakes of the story. And I want you to remember that because it's going to be important a little later on. I just felt like it, it all started to come together with Heaven's Word. Sure, you could say some of it was like kind of cliche or predictable, like... The old man, like, Emric's dad, being the villain. I think it's his dad, right? That wasn't really a shocker, but it wasn't really a negative to me. Maybe it's because I like dragons. Maybe it's because I grew up with Yu-Gi-Oh! With the blue eyes, white dragon. <laughs> but that area, 
that music it's just a lot of good vibes i just really enjoyed the vibes of heaven's word and also it has the meme factor too it does have that meme factor because a moment i make fun of a lot endearingly is when when <laughs> we finally get the eye the dragon eye right and then Amrick's like throw it over the bridge <laughs> And that has terrible consequences later on. It's just, a, it's just a terrible idea, just in general. Even in the moment, I make fun of that part a lot. I believe it was post Heavensward. That's where the all the shadow, not shadow, warrior of darkness stuff first happens. He's spying on us in that one city and <laughs> cuts the. As if that wasn't enough of a plot twist, it cuts the Thancred in the distance, <laughs> spying on him. Just that it still had the meme factor, right? So, so, just in terms of my personal investment, where it started to click for me, like the narrative stakes, the vibes, and also the meme factor. I already I listed you five ways where it just came together for me. I didn't love Estinian at first, but Estinian ended up being one of my favorite characters. So I got a shout out. You know, this is the start. Of uh, the long luscious locks of Stinian. I think I'm gonna put it in A tier, not S tier, because I think other expansions have higher highs, but they also have lower lows for me. Whereas Heaven's Word is kind of that just consistent, like I'm having a great time. Like even like some of the the city drama they had, I was into as well. Now I mentioned before that. I don't know too much about the community, general consensus, but one of the things I do know is that Stormblood is usually regarded on the lower ends. I can't really say I disagree if that's the case. Stormblood to me is, is a lot of mixed emotions. I think Stormblood is the, the epitome of high highs, low lows for me. High high, especially in the fact that it's very Asian based. <laughs> that's that's Nara bait right there. It's even freaking referencing Mongolia. How often you get a game talking about Mongolia, chat? That's not that's not super often. The characters too. Hien, Yugiri. Big fans. One of my favorite cutscenes, Hien is talking to I believe it's Lise in the prison cell. I don't know why. But I just really enjoyed that cutscene. That one really stuck out to me for some reason. Also, the girl, the girl who's like an enemy at first, she has the tattoo, and she's cool, and she starts becoming good later on. I really liked her. I don't remember her name, but I liked her as well. The dude in the village who wears orange, brown hair, liked him as well. Fordola, there we go. Fordola was cool. I really liked the, the tribe rivalry they had. In, in the Asm Step, I think. There's one character I didn't mention, though. And that's because I forgot his name. Uh, but I know he's connected to... Some girl I also forgot their name is. <laughs> it was on the tip of my tongue. It's like the big bulky samurai dude. And he has this little storyline with the evil girl. And then, like, she loses her memory. I wasn't a super big fan of that storyline. I'm not saying it was terrible. But I was like, you know, I was like, alright, sure. Like, okay, Gosesu, yeah. The fact that Gosesu survived was some BS. Gosesu, he was supposed to die. And then he was, like, lifting the, the roof, the collapsing roof. He was like, guys, leave me behind. And we all just stood there like, oh, shit. <laughs> that whole thing was a little silly. And I, I talked about what's heaven to where, like, I like consequences. If you're gonna have like a death, like just have it be a death. Don't 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 be like, well, psych. Turns out not only is Gosetsu alive, but also Yosuyu, and now they're in this like, kind of romance weird thing going on. I didn't need that, personally. I didn't need that. One of the biggest things, two of the biggest things, that I am not the biggest fan of in, in Stormblood, and I feel bad saying it, but one of them is Lise. And I don't dislike Lise, but I felt like I didn't. I didn't feel like I was super attached to Lise. Papa Limo died, and she's sad, and she's gotta like overcome that. And also, her, she, she wasn't even originally known as Lise, you know? She like took over, I think, her sister's name and identity. So there is stuff there, but I just wasn't 
I wasn't feeling it, you know? I was more attached to Hien and, and all that. Asia lands. I was, <laughs> I was, I was more attached to all that. But in in, in terms of lease, yeah, and the Alamegans and all that, it, it just wasn't. I just wasn't super invested. The biggest thing, I've been very vocal about this throughout my entire Final Fantasy XIV playthrough. The biggest thing that I did not like about Stormblood, and would have unfortunately further repercussions on the rest of Final Fantasy XIV. Are the villains specifically Xenos and Asahi, who would eventually be known Fan Daniel? I don't know how the community feels on this, so here's the thing maybe this is my cope. I have to feel like the community loves Xenos because otherwise, I don't know why they made him a big deal. <laughs> That's what I have to believe. I haven't sought out proof, because I don't care that much, ultimately, but... That's what I have to believe, because otherwise, why? <laughs> otherwise, why? Right now, we're just talking about Stormblood, so let's keep it self-contained. But... These feelings are gonna carry over. <laughs> They're gonna carry over a lot. But Xenos... It's not even just the fact he's a simple character. It's the fact he's such a cliche character. I really don't like the whole, uh, you know, I crave the violence of battle and I'm just looking for a worthy challenger. You know, yada, yada, yada. It, it, it's just not the most compelling motive, right? And there's that old saying. There's that old saying that I don't always agree with, but there's that old saying where it's like, the hero is only as good as his villain. I don't always agree with that. There's plenty of stories where I love the hero and the villain's like, alright. But I think this is one of those cases where, like, you know, all these expansions, they're, they're, they're pretty long just by themselves, right? So, you kind of need that that compelling villain. You, you need that more nuanced villain. And Final Fantasy XIV has a lot of those types of villains. And I'm not saying Xenos has nothing to him, but it's just so, like, exhausting to me. <laughs> Another example of this type of villain, like the Joker. The Joker is a character, obviously an iconic villain, but he's a character who's just doing it for the fuck of it a lot of the times. And and he loves Batman. He gets obsessed with Batman, right? That's kind of what they were going for here, where Xenos, he just gets an obsession for you because he finds you to be a worthy challenger, like on his level, blah, 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 right? And I just did not care for it. <laughs> I just did not care for it. I just, to me, okay, here's the thing, you, you said you liked having a rival, I will mention this later, I did, I never saw Xenos as a rival, I will elaborate more when we get to Endwalker, but I never saw that motherfucker <laughs> as a rival, like a proper rival, to me, Xenos is like the most tryhard character in Final Fantasy XIV. I mean that in the sense of like, they really tried hard to make you believe. <laughs> they really tried hard to make you believe that Xenos is like, more than what he actually is. And, and... If you're a fan of Xenos, that's cool, you know? I'm not judging you for that, but just for me personally, I just never vibe with him. And... On top of that, you have... Asahi being introduced. It gets a lot more egregious later on when Fan Daniel comes in, but Asahi, that that guy, he was supposed to be hateable and it worked. It worked. But I didn't like that it worked. <laughs> His stupid face. We'll get more to him later, but the fact that both of those guys were introduced to Stormblood, Xenos obviously having a big role. That's gonna... That's gonna take it down a peg. And thank you for mentioning that I brought him back so many times. I was gonna wait till Endwalker. I don't have to wait. I don't have to wait. Remember what I was talking about? How I don't like fake deaths. I love consequences. You end Stormblood, the main expansion. You end it... Killing him. And then post-quest, he comes back. Yeah, sure, like, Ashton stuff, whatever. But he's, he's already back. <laughs> I, I don't like that at all, man. I don't like that at all. Last thing about Stormblood is is how it ends. Not the death. Afterwards. It ends 
on this very, <laughs> very funny, cheesy musical number. <laughs> Where everybody sings on top of the castle. And, 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 you know, I've been bringing up meme factor with every expansion. I had to mention that one. That, that was a pretty good meme. Pretty good meme. I can't really say that as, as a positive or negative, but... <laughs> that was a thing. So, yeah, like, it's just tough because there's so much of Stormblood that I really like. But the parts that I don't like are just so important to Stormblood. I still like it a lot more than Realm Reborn, because, I mean, a Realm Reborn... I don't think a Realm Reborn has the lows that Stormblood has, but... A Realm Reborn was just like a flat out, like, just like... 7 out of 10 experience for me. <laughs> Whereas at least there's parts of Stormblood I really loved, so... Speaking of the general consensus and the community and how they feel, it seems like... Shadowbringers... Tends to be very highly regarded. I have to admit that it definitely was the peak of Final Fantasy XIV. I think Shadowbringers is the best expansion. I wasn't really that invested in the the warrior darkness thing. He just kept showing up in your, your private room. <laughs> My character was half naked, the homie just keeps showing up, uninvited, and starts telling me this sad story. And then like, it just kinda, it just kinda felt like Damn, don't you feel bad for him? You know, it, it just kind of it kind of got old to me. I was like, all right, I get it. You know, his life sucks. <laughs> you know, it was a sad backstory. I get it. So, I didn't like that, really. Um, what else? That might be the only thing. That I can think of, at least. Well, Shadowbringers is sick. <laughs> There's just a lot about it that I love. Two characters I talk about very often were in Shadowbringers. Those two characters being Runar and Chai News, the true protagonists of Shadowbringers. I love those two guys. Every expansion has that, like, one minor NPC who kind of has to prove themselves, whether they're just weak or whether they're not nice at first. You know, Chai News was the best example, at least for me. Chai News <laughs> was so satisfying to, like, see him just prove his worth and, and end up even becoming the damn mayor, of all things. Runar, I just really liked that whole thing with Ishtola. You mentioned Runji. Runji is a good meme. Despite everything, <laughs> despite everything, I, I hated his ass. He would always show up, but it was funny. That's like one of my favorite settings. Just that world as a whole is one of my favorite settings in the entire game. It's just satisfying to progress through the story because there's a tangible effect. I always like it in games when you don't, you're not just making progress in the story, but you feel that progress like in the environments. Like just you going out to the world, you can feel the progress you're making. The further you advance in the story, the more it affects the actual world. It's not just this self-contained thing that's only in the MSQ. No, like you're literally affecting the world and you're always getting that tangible effect throughout Shadowbringers. Admittedly, the, the whole reveal with um, Grahatia being the exalt whatever it's called. A little out of nowhere. <laughs> a little unexpected for, from my perspective, but also when this originally was released, apparently, Crystal Towers wasn't even mandatory, so it must have been more random for certain people. Considering how good of a character Grahatia is, that is obviously, like, just a really cool introduction for him. This was the closest this game ever got to make me cry. I never cried a single time while playing this game for 200 plus hours. It never got me to cry. But the closest I ever got was the cutscene after Thancred fights Renji by himself. Thancred is one of my favorite characters and I really enjoyed how his whole thing with Minfilia had been building and to have this be like kind of the culmination of that how that plays into Reen. 
I was just really like super invested in that. Even just looking at the existing characters, I thought they were done really well. Ishtola also has a big role here. Um, but I think the character that really solidifies the greatness of Shadowbringers is Emmett Selk. Emmett Selk is the best villain in Final Fantasy XIV, in my opinion. I just enjoyed Emmett Selk's presence in the story. Like, he's not this immediately hostile threat. He helps sometimes, but he's also like, you, you just know, right? You just always know he's gonna turn against you. And I think that's such an interesting dynamic. Yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a good point, Zekira. Smarter points that I'm making right now. I'm just saying things are cool. Lahi, good meme. <laughs> Lahi, good meme. That, if there's one thing I want you to remember from this, it's Lahi, good meme. It's almost kind of boring to talk about it because, because <laughs> I feel like everyone, everyone praises Shadowbringers. I, I feel like, I feel like what I'm saying is not, not surprising, not unique at all. All right. I guess we'll move on. <laughs> I want to remind everybody, I enjoyed all of this. <laughs> okay? I just want to remind everybody that I did enjoy all these expansions. Okay? I have to preface this because I'm about to talk about N. Walker. I was underwhelmed. <laughs> There's a lot of things about N. Walker I don't like. And it's not because I think they're just bad. It's just certain directions they took I was not the biggest fan of. And considering it is the finale, that was disappointing to me. Pretty early on, Ennu Walker, you go back to the past. You go back to like the ancients, right? And you get, you get to hang out essentially with the past um, Emmett Selk. The complicated name guy who was, who was a homie to you back in Shadowbringers. And also, Hydaelyn, I think their name was... Venat. You get to go back and hang out with all of them. This is probably just me. I'm not, I'm not acting like I'm right. I'm not acting like anybody else has to feel this way. To me, it just felt a little... fanservice-y? I know they're not the versions that you knew. Like, they die, right? They do die. You go back to the past. They fucking die, <laughs> okay? So there's still those stakes, right? But when you get to hang out with those characters so soon after you just saw, you know, Emmett Selk go out the way he did, it just kind of like cheapens it a little bit for me personally. At least like give me some more time between that. Like, oh, remember this character you were kind of sad about dying? Oh, well, they're back and you get to hang out with them in this kind of happier world, at least at first. You know, it just felt a little... It just felt a little much. <laughs> just felt a little much for me. It just felt like... Again, not saying this is true. But it felt like, oh, they knew these characters were popular. And they want to make the fans happy with the finale. So let's, let's have them hang out with those fan favorite characters. I'm not saying that's true because these are stories they have to plan out far in advance. At least I would hope so. But that's just how it felt to me. For a long time, your goal... The big bad that's been building up the whole time was Zodiark. Well, it turns out Zodiark pieces out like the first half of the, the game, the, the expansion. He's just gone. You beat him up. He's dead. He's gone. It was cool in the moment because it's like, wow, I, I thought that was going to be the final boss, but that's just like the beginning of this. That's crazy. Where's it going to go from here? If you're going to do that, you have to follow it up with something that's equally as satisfying in terms of you have to give me that feeling of yes this is appropriate for the finale and what they did was two things the first thing they did was they had Medion be one of the final bosses now I think in a bubble if N Walker was just its own expansion the Medion thing was cool good times right Good story, but as a finale, it didn't really work for me. It felt like, why is Medion, this random girl I'm meeting right now, the conclusion to this story that I've been playing for 200 hours? 
You know what I mean? Like, why is this girl I'm meeting now <laughs> one of the final bosses? Again, this is this is all for me. I'm not saying I'm right. It's just for me, when I have a finale to this long story, I, I want the, the final bosses to feel natural. Like, yes, this makes sense. Because I think of another long-running story. Not as, It's not the same thing. But I think about this fantastic video game franchise called Xenoblade Chronicles. <laughs> and I think about how the, how the long-running saga concluded with future redeems. And I think about that final boss. Yes, it, it wasn't what I expected, but it still made sense. It still felt like, oh, okay, even though it was a surprise to me, even though it was a twist, this still feels like a natural conclusion to this, this saga I've been going on, right? I didn't get that feeling with Medion. It just felt like, oh, okay, I guess they're telling this story now. And yes, it does relate to the final days and all that, but it just didn't feel satisfying to me in the way that I had hoped, being that Enwalker was the finale. But then they do! <laughs> but then! <laughs> they had to do it! <laughs> but then they had to do it! The actual final boss of this game I've been playing for 200 plus hours is Xenos. <laughs> And again, as I've stated, they try really hard to make you believe that this is suppo supposed to be the way it was the whole time. They try really hard to make you believe that, yes, yeah, Xenos, Xenos is your is the Vegeta to your Goku, man. But he's he's been your arch rival this whole time. No, he hasn't. No, he hasn't. He did nothing in Shadowbringers. <laughs> He was introduced to Stormblood, peaced out for a while, and then we find him at the very end. Why? And I remember, you can go back in the VOD, I openly shit on it. <laughs> I openly called it out, even in the moment. I, I don't know what I said exactly, but I remember thinking, yo, this is corny as hell. <laughs> It just felt like, why? And that's why I have to say, like, he has to be a fan favorite. This has to be why this is happening. <laughs> I can't think of any other reason why this is happening other than the fans love him, so, like, let's have this be the final battle. That's the only way I can justify it in my mind. And that's what I mean, like, I want the finale to feel like this natural conclusion, even if it is surprising, even if it is a plot twist. You can do that, you can, you can have a twist, but still make it feel sensible <laughs> to still make it feel like yes this is this is correct this is how it should have ended the whole time i did not feel that way with either medion or xenos just personally hermes who <laughs> did a hermes go by another name i remember hermes vaguely okay he becomes fan daniel later on okay yeah, that's, that's what I- okay, that's, that's why I asked if he became- I mean, again, the, the whole Meteon story, I'm not saying it was bad. I thought it was fine, but as a finale, it was just not what I was looking for. I'm not trying to diss the whole thing with Meteon. I, again, I, I actually really enjoyed the time you spend in that past area. I thought it was cool. Like, especially the part where you leave, and then, like, the homies, like, coming with that, that sick save. Great moment. Actually, this is a great example. I think Vanat is exactly everything that I wanted from Endwalker. That character. Hydaelyn was something you knew from the very beginning, since A Realm Reborn, right? And and throughout all the expansions, there's been twists and turns, right? You had Minfilia involved, but then all of a sudden Minfilia has to go. Thancred's crying. <laughs> and then you, you have the thing with, with uh, Reen. That's an ongoing story thread that evolves in ways that you don't expect. But it's 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 like impactful the whole way through, and then finally you meet Venat, and and you get to know Hydaelyn like a lot more intimately, and then when it finally concludes with that scene where she's on that monologue, and like the freaking meteors are going down in the final days, that's what I'm talking about. That's good shit. That's what I, that's what I want Endwalker to be, not like its own self-contained story that happens to be the finale, but more so like these long-running story threads that have been changing and evolving the whole time and they finally 
come together in N Walker. And I'm not saying there weren't more things like that, but I just feel like there wasn't enough for me. But but Venat was one of the examples where like clearly like that's that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Cause that's something you've been you've been invested in for so long. And to see it culminate in that way just made so much sense and it was just a good time. Going back to Fan Daniel though, that motherfucker. I hated that dude. Because <laughs> First of all, why'd it have to be Asahi, of all people? The dude with the stupid face. Why? And 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 then it's another cliche, because, you know, you have Xenos being like the straight man, right? Whatever, where he's just like, oh, you know, I, violence and battles and obsession and main protagonist. And then you have, to kind of contrast for him, you have Fan Daniel, who's like, oh my god, I'm crazy! <laughs> I'm crazy, and I laugh very loudly, and I make all these weird faces, and I dance during my cutscenes. They're supposed to be like indirect contrast. I get that, but it's just like it's like these two characters done in the most annoying way. Because <laughs> you have Xenos, who ends up being way more important than he deserved to be, and then you have Fan Daniel, who is just like it's just so egregious how annoying he is in Asahi's body. Every time Fan Daniel talked, I wanted to skip skip the dialogue. I would have skipped it if I wasn't streaming it. And then they give Fan Daniel. I think it's Fan Daniel. Like when you kill him. He has like all this huge monologue and it's like giving you these like epic camera angles in space. Nah. <laughs> nah. Bump that. Too late. I hated Fan Daniel. And there's just se several parts along the way that I really didn't like, like gameplay wise. That's right, we're talking about gameplay now. So <laughs> there's like these stupid mini games. The stealth sections, I'm not inherently against stealth sections, but there were some annoying stealth sections in Endwalker. The worst part of Endwalker? Probably the worst part in Final Fantasy XIV. <laughs> That's right, over the cheese quest in post A Realm Reborn. The worst part of Final Fantasy XIV is when you're playing in the soldier's body and you have to haul your slow ass to, to get to Xenos, who's in your body. Now, why is that the worst part? First of all, the gameplay was annoying. Second of all, what a waste of time. Here's the thing, right? I'm sure some people thought it was cool, like a big flex from Xenos, whatever. But you can't, you can't introduce that. You can't tease something with that much of a potential impact, potential ramifications. You can't tease that and then not deliver. He takes over your body for like two seconds. If you're gonna do that, you need to have consequence. You need it to matter because your character is not just your character, but your character is like the strongest out of everybody. Naturally, if, if the most powerful character gets taken over, surely, <laughs> surely something should happen. Even if people don't die, there should be at least some sort of like, just, just something, just something should happen. Nothing happens. Xenos just went on a little stroll. Just got your steps in. It would have been better if, if that just never happened. You could erase that part of the game, nothing changed. Like, imagine that cutscene I talked about a long time ago with The Realm Reborn. The Nanamo poisoning cutscene and all that shit. Like, imagine if that happens, but like, you know, not only is Nanamo still alive, but Raban grows back his other arm. <laughs> And it's like, fine. No political disputes. It was just a moment. Sorry, guys. We got a little heated. Imagine that. Because that's the equivalent of what happens with that, that stupid soldier thing. It was just a scene, a gameplay segment for the sake of it. That being said, you know, I still enjoyed a lot of N Walker. Like, the part where before you fight Medeon, the narrative walking, and you're seeing all the your friends and the souls and all that, and the musics like ramping up that shit was sick <laughs> a lot of the areas i like the moon of course the rabbits you know take them or leave them but still they still found ways to make it feel fresh even after all the areas you've already been through you, you know it's it still felt new a lot of the areas you went to a lot of the dungeons you went into i don't want to seem like i'm crapping all all over ed walker it's just certain crucial decisions <laughs> Certain crucial directions that the story takes that I just did was not a fan of. 
I'm gonna put N Walker in, in uh, B tier. Hold on. The post N Walker quest. We were all led to believe, at least I was led to believe, this was the finale. Like, this is it. The homies, this is our final journey. We're still gonna see each other, but Final Fantasy XIV as we know it, this is the end. B tier is Zeno's tier. You're led to believe that. And then the post patch, what happens? What happens, chat? You were there. A lot of y'all. What happens? The same shit. You got all the scions coming together to go to this other world that's in peril, who someone who's trying to save it is now attacking your world. How many times have we done that by now? Again, I enjoyed it. I like Zero a lot. Yo, shout out to Eulis. Didn't mention Eulis. Eulis MVP in both Endwalker and the post patch. It just felt like business as usual, right? It didn't feel like we just experienced this culmination. It just felt like, oh, oh I guess we're, I guess we're just playing more. <laughs> oh, I guess, I guess we're just playing more Final Fantasy 14. Okay. Yeah, the initial point was to save Beatrice's sister, but then it escalates in a way where it always does. Where now our world's in peril because. Freaking Golbez, who, by the way, hardest boss fight I ever fought on this stream. Man, we got shit on. Golbez is now in our world on the moon or whatever. The point is, is that it should not have been so samey immediately. When you have a finale, you gotta, like, do something different, at least initially. Also, with Endwalker, why was there so many... <laughs> a lot of fists. A, a lot of times where a cutscene just ends with somebody fisting. And I mean that in the most innocent way. But one thing I did love, and I hate to say this because I've always dumped on this character. I really enjoyed Alfie Knows Roll, guys. That cutscene specifically in N Walker, where you have it was like Alfie Know and Alize's moment in in the the cold area. Truly the goat. No, 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 no. But that scene is one of my favorites, for sure. For sure. One of my favorite cutscenes. Like, you know, N. Walker has a lot of highs as well. That's why I put along with Stormblood. I feel like there's a lot of highs with N. Walker. The highs are very obvious because, well, they should be obvious. It's the finale. But there's also a lot of lows that I pointed out that I did not like. And so that leads to Dawn Trail. First, I should say, you know, there's a lot of initial impressions I saw of Dawn Trail. I don't know what people feel about it in general. I don't know what people feel about it right now. Initially, it was portrayed to me through various comments that I happened to come across. Was that, you know, people thought it was like kind of boring, a little too cheesy, a little too lighthearted. And now in hindsight, I know they're, they're mostly referring to the first half. For me, as I stated, I, I wanted there to be a change of pace. I, I wanted there to be something new. And I'm actually happy that Dawn Trail was like that to start. I'm actually glad that the beginning of Dawn Trail felt unique. You know, it, it took a while to get to those high stakes, but I'm glad that Dawn Trail like actually felt different. I mentioned this in my Life is Strange True Colors video, where a lot of people don't like it when a franchise that they love, especially one that's like very dark and heavy, and then it gets more innocent, more lighthearted. People tend to not like that, and I get it. But just because I was craving something different, something fresh, I actually really appreciated that time in Dawn Trail, where you're just you're just doing these like odd things. <laughs> I do feel that in the first like third. I do feel like it was a little much in terms of two things. Number one, the fact that Woke Lamont sucked. <laughs> like they really, similar to like Xenos, like Try Hard, they tried really hard to, to let you know that the other contenders, the other promises, they're just better <laughs> than Woke Lamont. They, they really... <laughs> They were a little too on the nose of that. Like, there were just several times where they are like, Hey, yeah, remember, Woke Lamont kind of sucks. The stupid part where she gets kidnapped off screen. <laughs> girl failure, I think is the term. Fail girl, girl failure, either one. That was definitely Woke Lamont. 
I've seen the the opinion that the writing is worse, at least compared to Shadowbringers and Endwalker. And I'm not saying they're necessarily wrong. I do feel like some of that is just mostly aimed at how it's like more lighthearted. But I, I don't think it's necessarily wrong to say that. And the, the two things I think of right away when I hear that is... Woke Lamont, she's so portrayed as, as beneath everybody else... That when she finally does overcome Bakul... It doesn't really feel earned. Because earlier, we were led to believe she could not handle a 1v1 with Bakul. I gotta, I gotta accept my weaknesses, I gotta accept the help of my friends. Once you get that turn... It's very quick where she not only beats Bakul, but she also beats a lot of his minions at the same time. Not the most smooth character arc. And then also Bakul. Bakul is an asshole for so long. And now he's like, you know what guys, I suck, you're right. I'm the one who sucks. And it's just depression arc from there. They kind of go in reverse, where Wokelmont ends up being really strong out of nowhere, and Bakul is just like really pathetic <laughs> out of nowhere. Um, he, he just, like, tells you a sad story. <laughs> and it is sad, but, like, a little too much of a turn at once for me. You know what I compare it to? I compare it to both A Realm Reborn and Stormblood. A Realm Reborn in the sense that there's a lot of world building. A lot of new things that are introduced to you. So, yeah, it's gonna feel a little slow sometimes. But it's, it's all building towards something, right? Like, you can't say A Realm Reborn was for nothing. E even in ways you didn't expect, a lot of the stuff they built up in A Realm Reborn ended up paying off in the other expansions. So I would have to believe, I have faith, that a lot of the stuff that was introduced in Dawn Trail is going to pay off. Even though it felt maybe boring to some people or slow or whatever, just based on what we already saw, I would have to assume... That, yeah, it, it is building towards something, even if it's not obvious right now. And also compared to Stormblood, which I think was, like, a more common comparison I saw. It's all about, like, this leader becoming a leader. But, unlike Lys, I actually grew really fond of Woke Lamont. Like, I pointed out the weaknesses of their writing. Another weakness is, like, they really reuse the seasick joke, running gag... That, that's a little little much for as well. But Wokomont actually grew on me a lot more than I thought she would. I never disliked her, but... I don't know, just something about it. Like, she just really grew on me in a way that someone like Lise didn't. And I know, like, her view that, oh, you know, if we all get to know each other, we can find this common ground. A lot of people will say that's, like, childish or, like, you know, way more naive than all the other, like, nuanced, heavy themes. And I get that. But also, I thought it was fine for, for Dawn Trail because it's not like that's what ends up saving the day, right? What ends up happening? Turns out, oh no, she can't find this common ground with Zerosia. She has to kill Zerosia. That was my fear. I thought, I thought she was just gonna shake hands with Zerosia in the end. And he was going to have his own redemption arc. No, what ends up happening is that she realizes pretty early on, like, when when the city gets attacked, she's pretty much like, oh, yeah, I guess I got to kill this dude. You know that meme? <laughs> that meme of, like, we got to kill this guy, and then the other person's sad. That was the moment for, for Woke Lamont. Yeah, we're going to have to kill this guy. Like, so, so I think that criticism towards Woke Lamont... Like, I get it at first, but, like, if you actually, like, play the rest of it, it's not really true. Like, she is realistically, like, she is realistic in the end where she realizes, yeah, I can try my best, and it's gonna work a lot of times where I find common ground, but there are certain people, like Zerosia, where I gotta kill. Or, like, freaking Sveen, who was suspicious since the first conversation you had with her, she also has to put her down, you know? So... Like, I get it, but also I don't, because <laughs> they give you two major examples of, like, yeah, Woke Lamont realizes that, no, she can't just, like, get along with everybody. And she's willing to kill them, right? A lot of times in, like, anime, for example, or just a lot of other stuff, where they, they, they give you, like, oh, yeah, but you might not get along with them, 
but like, let's not kill them, because killing people is wrong. <laughs> that, was, that was also another fear I had with Woke Lamont, because Woke Lamont is a very, like, shonen anime vibe protagonist. But no, I liked her just fundamentally. I like that shonen anime vibe, I'm a sucker for it. But when you actually see, like, no, she does get, like, more realistic, and she buckles down when she has to, that's when I really started to love her as a character. Like, she shows the hesitance. She shows she doesn't want to do it, but she's willing to do it. And that's that's part of what becoming a great leader is. And, and that's the whole point of at least the first half of Dawn Trail is seeing that evolution of her becoming that leader who deserves to lead. You might feel like it is that way, where it is more cliche, or it is more lighthearted, or it is more innocent. And I'm not saying that's wrong. But I'm actually glad that they waited till like the second half for things to get crazy because as I said with the post MSQ like I didn't want to just go back to the same tone I didn't want to just go back to the same formula because to me like when the stakes are always high they're never high and I know that might sound confusing but like if every conflict is a potentially world-destroying or star-destroying conflict, it just starts to kind of lose meaning to me. And, and that's why I kind of felt hollow, even though I enjoyed it in, in post -N Walker. Like, I'm Again, I'm not saying that stuff was bad, but it's just like, we just got away from saving the entire universe. And already, I have to worry about our world being destroyed again? Like, when you keep just... <laughs> coming at me with, oh my god, the world's gonna be destroyed. It's like, I start to not care as much. I start not to not care. I didn't care much about Golbez, right? I didn't take Golbez as seriously as a villain. Why should I? Like, you can't... You need that time where you're you're actually just appreciating the world that you're trying to save, right? And I, that's why I like the first half of Dawn Trail. You spend an intimate time with that culture. You spend, yeah, sure, mundane activities and... and all these other things, but like that makes you appreciate and want and want you to save that world. Like when you see the contrast from that world being in peril to how it is, just you know how it is. That's when you feel the stakes, right? In that post Endwalker MSQ, you go to that world, that other reflection, whatever it is, the void, and it's already in shit. So like you don't really feel the destruction. You don't feel the destruction unless you feel it. Unless you feel that world at its just most mundane moments, right? Maybe I'm not explaining what I what I mean in the most articulate way, but by spending that time in those ridiculous ways, getting the alpaca, making the tacos, doing that little silly festival, you know, it just it just really emphasizes the stakes later on because you got to know this world so intimately. Yeah, I mean, that's the best way I can put it, even though it might sound confusing. Like, when the stakes are always high, then the stakes are never high. Especially for a, a new continent you're going to, right? If you were to just arrive at Tural, and everything's in, already in shit, you know, everybody's depressed. <laughs> you know, there, there is conflict in the first half. Of course there is. But it's more on, like, a smaller... I keep using the word intimate, but that's, that's really what it is. A more intimate scale, where it's more about the personal, you know woke Lamont in relation to her dad and Kona and then you have the freaking Bakul being an asshole kind of a bully right and then Zoroja is in his own little thing going on that smaller scale goes a long way when you finally get to that larger scale like okay now we're kind of doomed uh, it just helps characterize that setting a lot more rather than oh like we're already kind of like in a bad way right now it's more about we're not exactly at peace, we are a little lost, but it's not, it's not, we're, we're not in the shit yet, right? We will be, <laughs> we will be in the shit, but for now, you, you can enjoy the world as it is, so you realize what's at stake. Oh man, there's actually so much. Uh, Kona, I loved Kona. Big fan of Kona. I called him my promise for a reason. Big fan of Kona. And you know, the fact that Kona ends up being like the duo Don servant with... Woke Lamont, again, a little cheesy. I'm not going to say there's no cheese in Dawn Trail. There definitely has some cheese. But I think it makes a lot of sense at the same time, though. Because the, the whole point of that competition 
was for them to learn more about themselves and become their own types of leaders. And just the the themes, right? The themes of, of family and like protecting your own home, what people are willing to do. I think uh, the themes, even though it seems like a lot more lighthearted at first, I think the themes like really like struck home towards the ends, especially like the final part, right? Where you're going through that, the, the golden city and you're, you're seeing Woke Lamott and, and Namika and you're seeing Aaronville and, and his mom. Just the themes of, of family really strike home then, right? And and, and, and to me, it, it made me appreciate everything that came before. I didn't expect it to necessarily culminate in that way. Like, that's what I mean. Like, I didn't expect it to culminate in that way, but it actually makes a lot of sense with all the themes they've been building up this whole time. There wasn't really... Okay, well, I was about to say, there wasn't an area I disliked. But the, the Wild West area, it was funny. A good meme. I didn't love that area. I thought it was like the most boring part of the Dawn Trail, but it was a good meme. For the most part, I really liked the areas. The, the soundtrack especially. The soundtrack is always good, but I don't know. Something about Dawn Trail soundtrack really hit. There were just so many songs. The, the final boss song especially. 10 out of 10. There is one complaint that I have about the entire first half. I mean, it didn't bother me that much, but I, I was vocal about it. How it was like kind of convenient that Alfino and Alize are with us again and the excuses of as to why they're there are not good. I didn't make those remarks, but why why'd I make those remarks? It's because it really would have meant more it, it, it would have been a lot more transparent I guess I'll put I'll say like it would have been more suitable if in the first half you didn't have all the scions with you because Dawn Trail when you look at it as this fresh beginning I think that's how you should look at it I think that's how, that's how it was meant to be looked at when you look at it as this fresh beginning the way it's paced makes a lot more sense Right? If you're looking at it as just, you know, N Walker 2, <laughs> if you're looking at it as another iteration of the Final Fantasy XIV we just played, yeah, I can see why you have all those complaints. But if you look at it as just a fresh start, and now we have to build a foundation and work our way up, it makes a lot more sense with Dawn Trail. The problem is, at least for me, is that the Scions are there. So it doesn't really feel... Like, we're committing to this fresh start. I'm okay if the Scions came in later. I don't got a problem with them having a role in the story at all. It's just like, I really... I I, I just think it would have played off better if... If it was just you, Kryle, and Aaronville. Because Aaronville is not a Scion. And then Kryle... You know, she's had major roles before, but like, not compared to... You know, Alfino and Ishtola and Bancred. Let me give you, <laughs> let me give you like a metaphor, like an analogy. Yeah, I don't know much about the marketing, but they, they also they teased Thancred and Urianje would fight you, but that didn't really happen. I was actually really surprised there was not at least one fight where you fight them. I just thought it would have been best to have as as few scions as possible. Don't just add Alize and Alphino on there because they're the poster children. Just have as little as possible, maybe even just you, because to give the analogy. It's like, bear with me on this, okay? Well, just bear with me. It's gonna build to something. Just imagine you're in high school. You're in high school, and you're going on this school trip, this field trip to a museum, okay? And that museum might be really interesting. Maybe you yourself have personal investment. Maybe it's a, it's a topic you're passionate about, right? But your friends are going with you. So when you're at that museum, what's going to happen? You're going to be distracted by your friends. You're going to be more invested in your friends than in what's actually happening. Even if what's actually happening is cool. If it, if, if, if it does have things that you're interested in, you're just going to be distracted by your friends because guess what? You're in high school. You love hanging out with your friends. You're going to care more about them than what's going on. Compare that situation to when you graduate high school and you're going to this new university. This university is 
in a whole nother part of the country, maybe a new continent, right? And you're going there all by yourself. You're making that move. No family members coming along. No friends coming along. It's just you. And there's a lot of feelings of that, right? There's excitement because you wanted to go to that university, but there's also anxiety. There's also fears. There's also, you know, there's just a lot of weight because you are having to deal with that situation by yourself. I think Don Trail should have been more like that rather than that school trip. Because even though, I get it, fan favorite characters, right? But I feel like them being there, at least for me, them being there made the mundane feel more mundane. It's like they're constant, like they don't, <laughs> I keep, I, I'm sorry I keep mentioning them specifically, but Alfino and Alizé did nothing the first half of Dawn Trail. So all they really did was just remind you, just their presence, even at a subconscious level, they just reminded you of how mundane the activities you're, you're doing are. Because you just went through this, all these crazy bullshit with them. They've been there since the very beginning, at least Alfino was there since the very beginning. They're just kind of living reminders of like, oh yeah, we did go through a lot more like interesting stuff. <laughs> a lot more crazy things. Right? Whereas if it was just your character, it would there would have been a lot more like natural intrigue. Because, oh, I can't rely on the Scions. Even though my character is really powerful. I can't rely on the Scions. It's just up to me. It's up to me to adapt to this culture. It's up to me to learn. It's up to me to help Woke Lamont. I feel like Cryo at the very least. Cryo and Aaronville, I feel like, are justified to be there. Everybody else, it just felt like fan service, but you're having that fan service in direct contrast with all these new things you're trying to build up. You know, they're at odds with each other. Just like that museum example that I gave you. Like, you could be interested in all these things, but, you know, you got the homies. <laughs> you got the homies, so, like, whatever. But I actually really enjoy Dawn Trail. I enjoy Dawn Trail more than I thought I would. I think I enjoy Dawn Trail more than most people. I wanted it to be different from the get-go in terms of the tone. I didn't want it to just be heavy and, and, and man, this kind of sucks, you know. I'm glad that we got those intimate, borderline mundane parts. Grandmas be dying. I know I joked about it during my playthrough, but damn, grandmas be dying in Dawn Trail. <laughs> I can't believe they just... They introduced an old lady in Taral just so they can emphasize how they killed her <laughs> in the invasion cutscene. See, so yeah, I, I, I think I gotta say it. I think I gotta finally say it. I think I've gotta finally say it. I like Dawn Trail more than any Walker. <laughs> I think Dawn Trail, Endwalker, and Stormblood are probably like the closest in terms of how I feel about them. But I put Dawn Trail in A because Endwalker and Stormblood had more lows for me personally. Even the lows in Dawn Trail, I didn't care about in the end. What I view as lows in Endwalker and Stormblood were way more impactful to those expansions. Really, the biggest thing I'm confident in is that uh, A Realm Reborn is last. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, I don't want to play any of these ever again because of how long they are, but most especially, I don't want to play A Realm Reborn ever again. I think that final stretch was really strong. And I'm saying that as someone who was tired. If you were there, that stream was a marathon. <laughs> I was chugging, bro. But even despite that, I was like, yo, this is a pretty strong conclusion. Just the way... Th family... Not to get all Vin Diesel on you, but just the themes of family, how they all came together. How it was like, I'm gonna say it was never about becoming the leader. But that was just a wrinkle in the whole family theme, and you really see that in the ends, from multiple angles. Even freaking Kryle, this character you've known for so long. That's from a tweet, I didn't think of that. That is beautiful. That, that's actually true. The Golden City is a memory of love. That, that's actually good. Yeah, it's like it's like family, grieving, memories. Like, the, they stated multiple times. We were supposed to end it, but then you, you got me into the spiel. The whole thing about Alexandria is people live on in memories, right? And you hear that 
I've, I've heard, I've literally heard that from other media. It's supposed to be like this, this powerful thing to help you, you know, overcome grief. But I like how they kind of twisted that, right? They twisted that into Alexandria, where you can acknowledge, okay, yeah, people live on in memories, but also like not like this, <laughs> you know? Like so, so I like how they took that almost kind of cliche way of mourning, but but they put it in a way where like you kind of get uncomfortable with. So it's another reason why I liked Alexandria and all that stuff. And also, I just like, sorry, last thing. I just also like themes of personal grief. Obviously, there's a lot of grief in Final Fantasy XIV. But this, like, felt more personal to me. Even though it was so surreal, it also felt grounded. That's what I like about Dawn Trail. Ultimately, like, I have to be honest, I like when the story still feels grounded. You can have all these crazy things, but when you have these themes that you can like relate to in a, in a very grounded way that that hits home for me a lot and I felt like Dawn Trail had that um yeah okay that's it for real that's it for real there's my tier list I'm a little upset I didn't switch to the Dawn Trail OST because this is an old playlist but that's fine we were on a roll <laughs> 